Well, thanks very much. So I want to um, um, continue the discussion about EEG that Mario has started and well, hopefully get into some of those concepts. I, I want to just show you some um, <clears throat> basic um, e quantitative methods and show you how quantitative EEG can detect maybe seizures, check, detect changes in brain perfusion, um, somewhat changes in sedation. I'll talk a little bit about the BIS. And also continue to talk about prognosis. Um, <clears throat> so as Mauro outlined, uh, the, this slide shows raw EEG at the top. And raw EEG is very difficult to read. A uh, basic rule of thumb for, for, for people that are not used to looking at EEG is that a normal EEG looks like ventricular fibrillation. And an abnormal EEG looks like ventricular tachycardia or sinus tachycardia. So how many people know how to diagnose ventricular fibrillation? You better all raise your hand. <laughs> okay, you're all fired. No. <laughs> so if you know how to look, if you know how to read uh, sinus tachycardia or vent ventricular tachycardia, you know how to read an EEG for seizures. It's just you never, you haven't thought about it in that way before. Uh, we actually train all of our fellows. Um, to, to do this, and, and we actually train our nurses. So if nurses can, can learn it, physicians can. But it's too hard to read this and sit there and look at it all the time. What you'd really like to have is a trend of EEG that is eight hours or 12 hours long. And so you can, the computer can automatically convert these waves of the ocean into particular bandwidths. And you can display it as what's called a compressed spectral array where the frequency of the EEG is along the y-axis and time is along the x-axis. This is faster, 30 hertz. This is slow, 1 hertz activity. Or you can put it into bandwidths where you can look at the bandwidth over time. This is the alpha bandwidth itself. That's 8 to 12 hertz. And it's variable over time over the number of hours. And so you can look at these trends over time and then be able to after you've recorded the EEG for a while, go and see what happened when, what's going on with this patient, is the patient getting worse, better, et cetera. There can be multiple different kinds of quantitative EEG. Shown here is the classic compressed spectral array where the time starts here, and each, each, each minute or so there's a new EEG, and I'll talk about this uh, in the end when we talk about Bricolo's work from 1970s. But there are various different kinds of activities and you can, so this is very simple. You can look at this red line moving out and moving back and moving out. And you can, you can say, well, when it's out here to the right, that's faster activity and that's good. Keep, do something to keep that line out to the right. Very simple, but you lose the integrity of the EEG. You don't know what, the, what is in the background. If there's artifact that's driving this, you, you can't tell. So we usually use this kind of approach where we have both the, the raw EEG <laughs> And a, and a power trend all on one montage so that we can look at an individual time point and look at the trends over time. This happens to be the alpha uh, <clears throat> power trended over time. This is compressed spectral array, as I was showing you before, frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And you can see that there are some events here that are power spikes. With each one of these, this is the time here. You, I don't know if you can see this little gray bar. When you can actually go to that period of time, you look at the raw EEG, and what does that look like? Sinus tachycardia of the brain. We just happen to call it seizure. If you think about it, it's exactly, it's very similar to a, to a loop of, of activity, a sodium channel loop of, of irregular depolarizations. Here is a patient with this compressed spectral array over many hours. You can see all of these high yellow and pink uh, indicators right here. Each one of these are a seizure. And this is just one point in time where the, you can look like a seizure. And again, it looks, you, you can, you know, you can detect this. If you get, start using it, start to look at this, you can detect that that's a seizure. And, and so the quantitative EEG can help you to know what is the burden of seizures occurring in your patient. Now some people get frightened by this. Oh my God, they say, it's been going on for 12 hours. That's terrible. Yeah, but you don't know that it's going on in your patient for a week in the ICU. So it's better that you know that it's go been going on for 12 hours and you try to do something to stop it than you never knew and the patient never woke up and you say, well, they were just severely injured and it's God's will and that's it. 
Here's another way of looking at, um, of e so, so how many people, what do you think the, the incidence of ventricular tachycardia requiring treatment in your ICU is? How many people say 5% of the time? How many people say 10% of the time? How many people say 1% of the time? No one wants to vote. Okay. What do you think the incidence of seizures, non-convulsive seizures are requiring treatment in, in your ICU? It's 8% of the time. So just think about it in terms of you do EKG monitoring on every single patient for a, an event that is very, very infrequent. But seizures occur at least as often and you're not doing it. That's the rationale for doing this and, and you try to do it with power. So this is another um, kind of display. This is again a time trend. Here is power and each time, this is what's called the edge of power. So 90% of the power is under the curve. But when you see these big increases in power, see the red arrows here? Big increases in power, that detects high amplitude ventricular tachycardia of the brain or seizures. Okay? Here's another example. This, just, this was just uh, a week ago in a patient. I, I said, this is great. I have to go give a talk. I'm, I'm, I'm making a slide of this. I mean, so it's going on all the time in these patients. Here is what the same thing looks like in the compressed spectral array. So what's easier to look at, this one or this one? I, I don't know. It depends on what you're looking at. But if you're tracking this at the bedside, you can say something's going on and have an expert call up your expert, please look at this EEG. If, if you don't feel comfortable calling that a seizure, you can say, there's something going on, call my expert. And they can come by and say, yeah, the, yeah that's a seizure. You know, wh why have you let it go on that long? Because <laughs> <laughs> anyway, here's another one. Again, these high amplitude potentials here, you see each of these blue spikes are seizures going on in a patient. And again, ventricular tachycardia are seizures in a patient. Here is a, a very complicated array by a company. There's a software company uh, that's called Persist. I don't have any stock in Persist, um, who makes a whole battery of, of EEG displays. And there's something called R2-D2 from Star Trek. And R2-D2 is a particular kind of pattern. This is R2-D2 right here. But it's a rhythmics, rhythmicity amplitude integration. It, it's too long for us to go into. But when that number goes up, that corresponds very well with the occurrence of seizures. And so this is, this is something that is being looked at right now in order to detect seizures. See, doesn't that look like ventricular tachycardia? Here is, is alpha power going up. And in this case, when the alpha power goes up, there are seizures going on. Now, let me go to, to detecting quantitative EEG detecting perfusion. There's various ways, so, so you have these trends over time. This is the percent alpha trend. What we found many years ago was that when this trend goes from a normal variability, going up and down, up and down, up and down, to being flat, the patients were having ischemia due to cerebral vasospasm after subarachnoid hemorrhage. And you can quantify this on an on a analog scale or a digital scale. You can actually make a number of this. This is our analog scale, just looking at variability. One, two, three, four, five, poor, and, and one, two, three, four, rather, poor and excellent, or a digital scale actually making the calculation that I showed you. Here's a few examples. Here's a patient who has a stroke on the left side of the brain, poor variability over that region of the brain. This is the 97 paper where we had vasospasm. Patients started with good variability, developed spasm, had poor variability, recovered from spasm, have good variability. Here's the time course in individual patients. This is all angiographically confirmed vasospasm. The interesting thing is that the EEG changes by quantitative occurred before the transcranial Doppler ultrasound detected vasospasm. So I've just contradicted myself. I, yesterday I said transcranial Doppler sound was great, was the greatest thing, you know. And now I'm saying, eh, not so much, that, that maybe EEG is, 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 is better too. Here's another example. Now, if you look at the raw EEG, you could probably tell that there's a difference here, but, but to the, to the non-expert, it's going to be difficult. This is pretty simple. Simple, difficult. Here is a patient with stroke. Uh, sorry, it's a hemorrhage, but there's a, there's a low blood flow on this region, lower power on this side compared to the other side. This is, this is, these are the six to evaluate. Um, Mauro just showed this. This is data from the Columbia group, Jan Clausen 
showing a patient who had severe vasospasm. They had EEG change here, clinical neurological deterioration here. So this was eight to 12 hours. And then they had angiogram and they had a, va they had a treatment for the, to the, to the vasospasm, but they ended up stroking out and dying. How about if they would have started treatment back here? How long does it take for vasospasm to be present before the stroke is inevitable? This is what we got to before. Does the monitor make you better? No. The monitor plus knowing what to do with the information may make things better. This is what we do for nurses. Our nurses have this template at the bedside, this exact template. And our nurses, every four hours, make a, a, a reading of that EEG. Now, we have doctors that are looking at it real time. We look at it formally a couple times a day, and our fellow looks at it you know, many, many times a day. But the nurse is really looking at it and, and trying to track and correlate changes. And we teach them how to read seizures. Spreading depression. This is, the, this is, spreading depression is a sudden depolarization of the brain, which is not a seizure, but is something else. It's another arrhythmia, another arrhythmia of the brain. And this shows this spreading depression on a compressed spec, on a, on a power array here. And it may be, and, and, and Tony Strong and others have worked on this uh, over years. This, this is the next thing that's coming. So I don't know how long it's going to be, but this, we're going we're gonna to have to detect this and probably treat this because this is probably as frequent or more frequent as seizures. And this is just, again, drop in power over time. We are, we are so far, we're, we don't, we're, not, we're, a, we're documenting this. We're, we don't know how to treat this. We don't know what the treatment is. We don't know what this is, but it's coming. And here, is, here are some uh, drops in power here that show drops in power, which are probably spreading depression in this particular patient. Prognosis. Quantitative EEG, after you've done it on a patient, if you've done it for one or two or three days or four days in the ICU and you have it, some data, you can use that to help you uh, predict outcome. Bricolo actually did this with compressed spectral array, was very powerful um, uh, uh, predictor. We've done this with percent alpha variability over time, and this is poor percent alpha variability, and the patients who had a poor outcome, uh, and this was actually a time of discharge, 30-day outcome, had worse percent alpha variability than the people that had good outcomes. And when we put this into a model looking at, this is in traumatic brain injury, looking at the classic predictors of traumatic brain injury, um, Glasgow coma score and age and hypoxia, hypotension, pupillary lack, uh, unresponsiveness, et cetera, um, the, the classic criteria gives you about a 75% predictive value. Uh, it's probably a little bit more with impact, project impact now. But, but, but these data that are now old raise that to about 90%, 89%, 90%. So you can see, as, as we heard about from before, this helps prognosis. And uh, a colleague of mine looked at this at six months and found the same thing, that the, that the mean percent alpha variability at three days, when it was low, predicted bad outcome, and when it was high, predicted good outcome, independent of all those other markers. Evoked potentials. We talked about this briefly. What's an evoked potential? This is where you stimulate the brain, uh, stimulate the, the wrist or the, or the peripheral nerve, and the brain responds. You, you actually stimulate it a thousand times, and you average the response. And the response is really small, and, but you can, you can detect it. You can do it from a, a somatosensory, from an arm, or from the brain stem, an auditory. The N20, which is a, a, a response at 20 milliseconds after stimulation, is the classic marker. And the classic data is if you have bilateral absence of this, you have poor prognosis. And here's data that suggests, and there have been many, many studies. There's probably 150 studies that have studied this concept and after hypoxic ischemic injury and after traumatic brain injury. After hypoxic ischemic injury, if the, if the bilateral SSEPs are absent, it's 100% mortality or persistent vegetative state at you know, six months, 12 months. And the favorable outcome, if, and this is a number of uh, patients now, 700 patients, uh, well, about 400 and almost 500 patients, favorable outcome is, in, is present in less than 1% if, if both SEP, SSEPs are absent. Now, if they're nor abnormal or present or one's gone and the other one's there, then it's all a, ma a mishmash. It's, it's, it's very poor. Uh, predictor. So they have to be both bilaterally absent. Having done some of this, usually one's present, and that's the problem. 
trending it. This paper of Bosco, I could I, I agree with Mauro. This is a great paper to read. This is what one of these N20s look like, and you can track it over time. So this is uh, 08, 100 in the morning, 9, 10, 12, and you could track it over time and look to see if the amplitude changes or the latency uh, of the response changes. Here's a patient that did change. This is early time, late time. So time goes this way in this, this pattern, and you can see that this N20 disappears. Something went wrong with that patient. So again, you can detect it, and there's no change in the coma exam. So something goes wrong, and you can detect it, and you can intervene. Sedation. Somebody asked the BIS monitor. Sedation. So if a patient is sedated, comatose, or dead, the EEG gets worse and worse and worse. And what you'd like to do is be able to monitor how much of the slow EEG they have versus how much of the fast EEG that they have. Psychotic. This is the BIS monitor. Sorry, to say psychotic and BIS monitor in the same, sorry. Um, this is the BIS monitor. It's a one, basically a, a one area of the brain is monitored, and you get a number. That number is an algorithm of how much slow and fast activity there is. It's, it's a proprietary algorithm. We don't know what that algorithm is. That's the problem. The company will not share it. So we don't know of how good it is. The problem is you can be brain, so 100, a value of 100 is normal, a value of less than 60 is being sedated, so 40 is very low and very bad. The problem is that you can be, nor you can be brain dead and have a, a value that's normal. And there have been published articles on this. So in general anesthesia, in the operating room, in a cardiac patient, for example, where the brain, there's no disturbance, there's a global dysfunction, if you will, a global drop in blood flow, this, is, this has been shown to be a reliable indicator. In an ICU patient who maybe has sepsis, a generalized problem, not a stroke, not a hemorrhage, not a primary focal problem, this may be reasonable, although I, I say maybe. I, you have to use caution because we don't know how the IV anesthetics affect this number. We know how the, the inhaled anesthetics affect the number. I mean, it's, it's been very carefully orchestrated to be an intraoperative tool. So, and there are other devices out here. There are other forms of this concept but the, the BIS monitor is probably the one that's uh, most commonly used. Again, I don't have any interest in them, um, any, any, any um, conflict of interest with them. So, um, I, and we, we don't use this, but, I, but this is one of the most commonly used brain monitors in ICUs worldwide. So there are people that use this and try to titrate sedation to it. Um, I'm gonna summarize. Quantitative EEG allows longitudinal assessment of the patient in the ICU. You can detect seizures and ischemia with it, but you have to understand what the parameter is that you're looking at, and you have to put it into context with the patient. Each one of those parameters can go up and or down for reasons that are other than seizures. So you have to look at the raw EEG and you have to verify. Um, it doesn't make the diagnosis by itself, but it helps you make the diagnosis. Uh, evoked potentials combined with quantitative EEG has really been shown to be useful, not only in the Bosco paper and other papers, whoops, and uh, I had here sedation monitor and I took it off because um, I'm not so sure it's a good thing for sedation, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs>